big part of what we're going to talk about now for the next 45 minutes, and then we're going to talk around for an hour, hour and a quarter this afternoon, is some of the real detail of what we understand the new agent's regulations to be, which are obviously very important. As Erk um, asked earlier today, you know, whoever is a current agent, um, whoever is uh, wanting to be an agent or who might be an agent in the future, these regulations actually um, massively infringe on agents' rights in lots of different ways. I'm not saying that's necessarily always a bad thing. The one question that we always get asked is, uh, well, if I was an agent before 2015, do I need to pass the new exam, for example? And we'll come on to that um, in a minute as well. So uh, what I wanted to do was set out what, I th what we thought were the main themes of the new FIFA um, agents' regulations. Um, the brief background is these regulations were supposed to come in actually in the summer. Um, Erkut and I talked about that actually, talked about doing this course along with Jesse actually in the springtime last year and said we actually need to do this course really quickly because we were sure that the regulations would have already come into force, that agents would already be doing the exam and that the new licensing regime would already be in place and none of that has obviously happened so far. But what we do have is a very good idea uh, based on various um, uh, versions of the regulations which are now seem to be, appear to be in final form. Um, and that allows us to be able to glean some quite important detail as to what um, is on the horizon. Um, and so what, what I've done, what we've done basically is highlight, I don't know how many, six or seven elements that we think are probably some of the most important um, points to touch on. Not necessarily any particular order, um, but the most controversial and important one to a degree is the first, which is uh, the commission cap. Before I go into little, we go into a little bit of detail, um, does anyone want to tell me what the controversy is around what the FIFA agents commission cap proposals are? Lowering percentage to particular percent uh, to particular amounts, correct? Yep. I think the differentiator between clubs uh, commissions versus the player and the player is lower than the clubs. Yep. Many argue that should be the other way around. Yep. It's also infringing on the contracts rights between players and agents to determine themselves what the rights might be. Exactly. Um, Jamie, if you can just go to the next slide quickly, because I think that's the commission cap in detail. Yep and then I'll, I'll come back to the other points. So I'll just let you, the people in the back that might not have the best eyesight as well, I'll talk through each point in turn. But that's very much, Peter, what you talked about um, in terms of what is apparently um, uh, on the, the menu for um, FIFA and for agents. And we'll talk about it after lunch, which are actually then the potential challenges and issues that will apply, especially, as you said, between the con privity of contract between player and um, agent. So let's take it one in turn, if that's all right. I should have had something to eat as well. Um, <laughs> the first one is what FIFA have said is that 3% of the player's gross remuneration can be paid to an agent if acting for the player. So 3%. That's what the cap basically is, 3%. Um, but what, you could, what um, a player's agent can also earn is a further 3% if they are acting for um, the purchasing club as well. So as we talked about before, this is why it was important to understand the nuance of who gets paid for what. Um, ultimately, uh, the regulations at the moment, or rather the regulations what is what they are going to be, um, equal 6%. So if you are a player's agent acting for the player and the buying club, you can earn up to 6% of a player's gross basic salary, plus some bonuses and other things on top, potentially. Now, uh, there was a, a point about um, uh, players' agents earning a certain amount and then uh, agents earning a certain amount of acting for the club. Exactly right. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute because I know this is an important point that you mentioned as well in relation to if um, a player is acting, sorry, if an agent is acting for the player, the maximum they can earn, subject to these little caveats um, on smaller remuneration, is 6%. However, the regulations were drafted, uh, and again, Urquhart will talk about the, the consultation process maybe in a little bit of detail in a second, um, that if you're an agent acting for the selling club, if you're an agent acting for the selling club, you can earn up to 10% of the transfer fee. So you can already see the disparity uh, and the potential, sorry, I'm literally in the way here both ways, I'll let you go, <laughs> see how much I can squat. Um, 
so the difference there is is that on one side you have uh, players agents only being able to earn a maximum of six percent and however if you're an agent with a very close relationship as Urquhart's explained to a particular club they can act that agent can act sell side and earn up to 10 percent of the transfer fee they're the current proposals on the table Urquhart, do you want to talk about that now or yeah I think it's important thank you Dan <coughs> So just to give you a quick, sorry, Daniel, I didn't laugh enough, but still there's still something left. <laughs> I was so hungry, sorry, guys. So in 2018, I need to go back to 2018, April 2018, there was the first agent consultation process with FIFA in Zurich. So, and I was invited at one of, one of these agents. So worldwide, there were agents there from America, from Australia, from Africa, from Asia, from Europe. So the names, uh, all the big names you know, they were all there. Also the one who just passed away, Mino Raiola, and everyone else was at that meeting. That was 2008 in April, and I was part of that consultation process when FIFA said, we want to consult agents when we do new regulations. That was the goal. That's what I was thinking that was the goal when I was there. But the passed away Mino Raiola said something over there that was uh, very interesting at the time. He said, like, uh, this is not a consultation process for us. It's just a media show. And I was like, I wasn't really on his opinion at the time. But later on, when the time passed, then I realized, okay. So he was right on the first day, right? That so it was not a really consultation progress, guys, a process or uh, a group. It was literally... What I realized after two years being in that process, then I left. I said, I'm, I'm leaving the process. I don't want to be part of this uh, group anymore. I left in January this year um, after FIFA again and again and again never let us talk to stakeholders in the group. Only the first meeting was with the president of FIFA was there for five minutes. He just say hi and then goodbye. And then the, some stakeholders were there. But after that, and none of the, so we had ongoing meetings in Zurich every two or three months, and also online during COVID, but never, we were never able to talk to stakeholders really. So we were just talking to some representatives of FIFA, and it was always promised, and especially concerns of 10% and stuff, so we could address them, but never, never anything changed. And it was just one-way show, we will change this to that, and that's it. It was listening to us in a kind of way that they can say, Yes, we listen to agents, you understand? So that's what I realized, I was in a show, actually I'm suiting them and not agents. So why I'm there? I wanna represent agents, right? That's why I'm there. My goal is to represent the agents and to make regulations which is good for the agents worldwide. That's my goal, I'm on the agent side. But I realized I can't do it. I have no impact, zero. I'm not listened at all. I'm just there for them to say, yeah, we talk to agents. That was a nice progress, a nice process. We were sitting with agents on the same table. It's all bullshit, right? It's uh, yes, the clubs. So U UEFA, FIFA, Fifth Pro, ECA, European Club Association. So they are all stakeholders in football. So and they decide about us agents sitting on a table and telling us how we should work and how we should get paid. And we agents are not a part of the stakeholders group. We are just a loose group of different different agents worldwide coming together and but we are not an you know association or stakeholder which is a big problem actually that's why we're not deciding with them about us they decide about us and that's a problem that's a key uh, problem there and i was for example this question about the uh, why is the club agents is getting paid 10 percent and the players agent only three i asked this question 10 times and no one could answer me because i know there's lobby behind Right, the European Club Association will push it for 10% because they're protecting their club sites agents. And we don't have any lobby, so with other words. So we, I realized I have no impact at all in doing anything there. And then, because I gave them one more chance in December, I said, look, if you're not having in January this talks, then I'm gone, and I was then gone. It was in a meeting, I said, thank you guys, but I'm not feeling you guys listening to us at all. You guys using us for the future to say to the media, yes, when we were doing these regulations, we have consulted agents, bullshit. 
They used us for their own goal, which I made publicly as well, which I'm not scared of saying as well. I'm because I'm whatever it is, it is, you know, you can't hide the truth. And whatever I feel, I say as well in life. And that's what I said. And so when we were in this process, so I tried to explain certain things from our side, from the agency sides. But as I said, we were unfortunately not heard. So, and this has never changed the 10%. It will be probably, I think one of the reasons is why FIFA still not announced that one is they're fearing so many law cases coming, right? I mean, I think there are already some cases against FIFA out there uh, about that, you know, and I mean, the lawyers can tell more about that because I, I have some law background as well. I can say certain things are really, I'm not sure if that's legally correct or not, you know, but uh, Daniel can explain it more in detail. So imagine I'm the agent, so there are so many young agents here or trying to become an agent. You sign a player, 16, 17 year old, you look after the player for four or five years, giving the player boots, going to the games, train ticket, fly ticket, everything, helping out, needs a doctor, spending money for five years. And then it comes to a deal and the club says, yeah, only 3%. And you have to pay tax on that and you probably work with another agent on that deal as well. So you split the commission into one and a half, you pay tax on that, and then FIFA says, yeah, you have to survive with that. And then imagine your player signs with the League One team or championship, League One, League Two in the beginning, right? Young player, there's not much money. So the first time for that young player, you may probably make money is a second pro contract, not the first one. And that will take five to six years of investment of time and energy. And then they tell me, you're only eligible to get 3%. How is that possible, right? How is that possible? How can someone tell me like, I can only earn 3% of that deal? So how do they know how much expenses are? But on the other hand, they say, yes, yeah, someone representing a club who just made two phone calls, talked to two of the clubs and made a deal and broker a deal is eligible to get 10%. Do you understand? So they do that because they don't understand how we work and what we do. That's a problem because we're not stakeholders. So it must be the other way around. An agent should be can t earn up to 10% and someone representing only the club should get only 3%. What is he doing, someone representing a club? Getting a phone call, brokering a deal, 3%. I'm just saying if it would be fair, it must be the other way around, but it isn't because they're stronger. And I mean, they say we can earn up to 6%. Who guarantees me that? That I will be a dual representative agent? No one. They say, yeah, uh, uh, but the play agent can earn up to 6% if he represents also the buying club. And if, and if there's another agent on the buying club already, the club's putting agents into the game all the time, what will I do? I stuck with 3%, right? So with other words, guys, they're creating a monopoly of agents. They don't want you guys in there. I'm telling you honestly, straightforward. They don't want new people to break through into this business. Not with that. They want to, that's what they is there. They will create a bigger monopole because none of you can survive a 3% model. None of you, if you want to make it as a business in the beginning. It's impossible, right? If you get six, maybe sometimes, you need to work actually more on the club side than on the player side in future, right? So there will be a lot of problems. What will happen? Clubs will pay agents under the table. What will happen? Players will start paying the agents. So they're shifting actually the money from the clubs to the player side. So none of the agents will say, especially if you're a powerful agent, you're not saying, hey, I'm working for 3% for you. You say, I got 3 or 6% from the club and the rest you pay me as the player. Yeah, it's a consultancy fee or whatever you call it, right? So they're shifting actually the money to the player side, right? So it's discussable. There's a lot of things going on if that's correct or not correct. But for me as an agent and I'm thinking, I'm putting myself back 10 years. 15 years when I started as an agent, like how difficult it was to sign a young player and to survive. With this model, it's very difficult, guys. It gets more difficult. But as I said, nothing is clear yet. And I think FIFA is fearing as well that agents will go against them. They didn't want to bring it out before the World Cup, is my personal opinion, not to create problems. You know, FIFA has already 50 problems right now before the World Cup. Even there's a new Netflix show I just see, I uh, need to watch as well. So they have, I think they have their own problems, and that would be a huge problem if they would have announced, I think, the regulations, the agents already going to law, uh, to court, and I think they stopped it for now. I, I think they will do it after the World Cup. But it will come. It will. I'm not saying everything is bad, guys. 
I am for regulations. I want regulations. I want an exam to come, 100%. I want there needs to be a barrier for if someone wants to act as an agent, he needs to have some knowledge. Because why? We, we are someone who are guiding a football player's career. Right? We need to know what we are doing. If we don't know it, we are harming our clients. And the football player's uh, career is very short. The average plays seven, eight years. The best players play 15 to 17, maybe. But most of the players are not playing long-term football. So you are deciding for someone's career and helping to guide it. So you need to be very good in what you do. Right? And therefore, an exam is important. But if you learn for it, you pass it. Simple. People ask me, hey, how difficult would I can I pass it? Yeah, if you learn for it, you pass it. It's like a language, if you learn for a language exam, if you learn for a school exam, it's all about sitting down and learning all the clauses and everything else. And it's possible. So I've done it in the time back in Germany, in Frankfurt. And many people have done it there too. But I've seen there's so many people who didn't even prepare themselves, come over there, and then they don't pass. Or just were reading one week some documents. That, that's not enough. So you need to know what you're doing, and then it's possible. I think that's on the on my side. I think I can give it back to you. Give it to the lawyer. <laughs> Sounds so ominous. Um, if you can just go back one slide, if that's okay, Jamie. Um, okay. Th thanks, Erkut, for that. Um, I think I'm really interested in Erkut's views because he's obviously been on the inside um, of a lot of those consultations, which have actually been really illustrative to understand um, FIFA's position. Um, I'm going to talk about maybe five or six of the other main areas. Um, uh, Jesse is then going to chat through, and then that's more or less just going to frame the then the first hour or so of the conversation, hour and a half of the conversation for this afternoon, about going into detail with a number of the challenges and issues that Erka and Jesse can can talk through in quite a lot of detail as well. So if we've if we've talked about commission cap, and we're going to talk this afternoon about actually the the legal challenges that will almost certainly happen. I also think, for what it's worthwhile, Urquhart's view is on FIFA not wanting to do too much before the World Cup. I also would be hugely surprised if FIFA aren't actually having private conversations with the biggest agents, associations, who are potentially going to bring the commission cap legal challenges to see if there's a midway point to be able to find found. I, I wouldn't put that past, actually, that there will be some um, agreement, because effectively, this is the major sticking point that a lot of agents will be quite rightly concerned with. The second is the exam, which Urquhart touched on. We're going to talk this afternoon about actually the, the, the various facets of the FIFA regulations, which will go into what will be a multiple choice, a I think it's a 20 question multiple choice um, exam. Um, and that will effectively then, if you pass it, give you the license to be able to operate in any FIFA jurisdiction um, uh, country. The thing about the exam is, in the past, there were questions about national association regulations as well. This one will simply be on the FIFA regulations. And so, uh, myself and Urquhart have been in some conversations with FIFA where they've actually provided us um, uh, the types of questions on the, um, on the multiple choice question, uh, qu multiple choice test that will be, um, and then what it will be based on, which is all the usual stuff pre-2015 that was ultimately there. The two things we should stress on the pre-2015 um, exam and the regulations was that the pass rate was very, very low. I'm not sure, in truth, whether that was because of the caliber of the candidates or whether it was also because the bar, because the, the, the knowledge bar was actually quite high and the questions were pretty complicated at that, in truth. What is the pass rate? We don't know what the new one will be. Um, I'm not sh necessarily sure. Well. I'm not necessarily sure they will go like, we want a 50% pass rate, but the last pass rate was so low that I think they will have to try and reduce the um, difficult, potentially the difficulty of the exam, or maybe they'll try and keep it as it was. Because I think what Urquhart and Jesse have said in the past is very, very important to explain is, you know, since 2015, because anybody can basically become an agent, the level of understanding of law, regulations, commercial elements, how things work in practice, has basically just dropped, dropped massively. And that's led to lots of different issues. Um, at, at least a very bare minimum set of regulatory requirements is, is not good enough, in my view, full stop. I think anyone wanting to be an agent needs to understand in detail and pass a test to understand the rules and regulations and the laws to understand how that works, per se. Yeah.
I can't remember, was there a big fee? Yeah. Um, fee for actually pass when you when you pass the exam and then to actually fee to be an agent on a yearly basis. I don't think it was a huge number. No, I don't, it's just a fee to sit the exam. Yeah. There will be definitely something like that. I don't but think it was... If like yeah. 500 or something like that, they will keep it very low, they said. Yeah, I don't think it will be huge. Correct. Well, I think there's going to be some nuance in it all. The, the, the basic position is, is if you were an agent who had passed the exam before 2015, you won't need to pass the exam again, yes. which I, I'm not so convinced about, but that's a different matter because the age, all the regulations change. So, you know, you've got to be, that's a different story. That's a political decision that's been made. Um, I think what, what FIFA will say is you will have a certain amount of transfer windows to effectively transition from the old system to the new centralized system. Some people have said it will be two windows, it might be slightly more, it might be slightly less, depending on when the regulations are implemented at first instance. So you won't, you won't be able to, you, you'll have a period of time in order to pass the exam, but if you don't within that period of time, then you won't be able to uh, undertake intermediary services. Yeah. Will there be certain people exempt from the exam? Like we don't think so. No. So it looks like if you, even if you're a lawyer or a family member, you'll still have to pass the exam in order to undertake the services. I think if I remember correctly on the latest definition of the regulations, you have to take out, there's a mandatory um, obligation to take out insurance, which is, in my mind, very sensible. <laughs> Correct. Um, it's in like the, the national, national exam, I don't know, because you will also be an agent. agent. Yes, yeah, so what will happen, which, will be, which is good, which is different to the current situation, is let's say you uh, registered in the FA, the, the UK Football Association, as a registered intermediary, you would still have to register in every other jurisdiction you were working in. Now with the new lic FIFA license, you will only need one FIFA license to work everywhere. So if you have passed the uh, exam in Italy, so that would be enough. You, they, they will accept that they said. You don't have to do a FIFA exam. Yeah, you don't have to. So because the Italian exam is actually more difficult than the future FIFA exam. It is literally. So it's not easy to pass. I know some people who passed it. So it's very, very difficult. And they do like a two, two different tests, I think, on legal side and uh, on the football side. So it's very difficult to pass it. I think only 2% or so pass it or so when, they've when they started it. They started it recently, a couple of years ago. And FIFA is accepting that. FIFA is saying whoever passed in Italy, I think France as well, they will be accepting them vice versa. And if someone has the FIFA, then they will also be accepted to work in the Italian market. Because they don't have an exam here. They, they can build one their own if they want. So what Urquhart is basically saying is, if you have passed an exam in a jurisdiction up until now, then you won't need to re you won't need to take the FIFA exam. But as soon as the FIFA regulations come into play, whenever they do, December, January, February next year, if you haven't passed an exam previously, you will then have to take the FIFA exam because that's when FIFA will start to have jurisdiction over the agents market. Correct. You, there won't be there won't be any more national association agents exams. It will all be a FIFA agents exam that will then be um, sat in each of the national associations. But it will only be a FIFA credited exam that will be required. So just to clear, so will it need to be part of the FIFA exam? You can operate in any territory, or will you be able Correct. To uh, no, you'll be able to operate in any territory. All really good questions. Yes, yeah, sorry. Give one second. Great question. So my underst our understanding is, so the question was, um, 
if uh, it's a fee for exam, are there going to be questions based on national associations? My understanding is no, there won't be. It will only be on the FIFA regulations and the various FIFA regulations at that. Lucius, I think you deserve um, a book for that if you'd like to take one from the top. Even though you whispered it at me, I just about managed to hear it. So, yep. Um, I don't actually know how many languages. If, okay. German and Spanish. French, English, German, and Spanish. Do you have one? Just one second. Sorry. Is okay. no, I was just adding to that the FIFA covered territory, obviously. There are some that aren't there FIFA are affiliated. Yeah. Um, and adding to that, uh, would that be just what would be that country's FA? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure how that will work in practice. I mean, if you're not a FIFA affiliated FA, then no. Great question. So um, that is actually one of the bits here where it talks about ongoing professional development. So what will happen is um, if you have already passed the, a previous exam, you have to do 20 hours of CPD, prof um, uh, ongoing professional development, um, on a yearly basis, 20 hours. You have to do more. But if you pass the exam from whenever it is at the end of this year or next year, the FIFA exam, you have to undertake 10 hours of professional development every year. And if you do that, it's automatic. Your, your, your agent's license is automatically renewed so long as you pay the money. Um, my understanding is, is that that will be part of the, um, the basis for the fee that you pay, is that there will be a central FIFA video system platform that enables you to be able to undertake those 10 hours or 20 hours on a yearly basis so that you can say and certify that you've spent the time doing it. Um, okay. So the, the, inter the really interesting, well, there's lots of interesting elements also, we've talked about Obviously, at the moment, it was a trick question. We didn't ask everyone at the beginning, did we, what we usually do. We say, if, um, does, the, does FIFA um, regulate managers? Oh, yeah. That's good enough. Well, you know the answer now. Um, so, uh, well, still, FIFA doesn't regulate. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, that is changing. So, um, uh, whenever the reg new regulations come in, if um, an agent is going to work with a manager, um, that is now covered under the FIFA regulations, which it wasn't before. So, for example, yeah, sorry, go on. Would there be a, also a cut on the yes, it's the, it's the same, I believe. I don't know. I, I guess so, but maybe not. I don't know because managers. It, it's a different breed, I guess, but. You still get a commission. They still sign contracts like players, mm. huge contract. So, I, I believe they would put the same commission in there. Otherwise, I can't imagine to leave that free. It's a good question. Let me. I will check on the regulations in the break if that's all right. It's a bit tricky. That's for the manager. It's very tricky because I remember when I, I signed two managers and I tried to register their contract with the English Airport. Yeah, you don't need to. No, I, I, I was told that that was when I knew that mm. they were not regulated. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Will. Well, good question. Uh, the short answer is, owner, depend, if, if you own a club in a particular territory, you're under certain obligations by the National League or the Federation. So I can give you my experience in the Premier League and the EFL and the Football Association, is that owners need to pass the owners and directors test. They need to show sufficiency of funding on a yearly basis. Um, they need to declare um, that they don't own any other businesses which could have conflicts of interest with, the football in, with their football ownership, etc. So there are regulatory standards, but they're not probably to the same level that agents and players are regulated in truth. With other words, if you have money, you're in. in the owner's side. Well, not if you're from Russia, probably, at the moment. Uh, <laughs> um, the next element that we actually hadn't quite touched on, but Irk had actually did in his uh, uh, Agent A example, um, and also um, we mentioned it in terms of dual representation. So if you remember, dual representation is when a player's agent will also act for the buying club. Now, 
You may have seen the example a few years back with Mino Raiola, obviously before he passed. Um, he was involved in the Paul Pogba deal uh, where it was reported that he acted for Juventus on the sale on Paul Pogba for the contract renegotiation and Manchester United for the buy side. So he acted for all three parties. Now, um, Carol in the back, when she asked the question about conflicts of interest and waivers generally, asked a very important question, which is if it's sometimes difficult to see, or rather there is looks like this inherent conflict of interest when you're acting for the player and the buying club, there is an added layer of potential conflict if you're acting for the selling club, the player and the buying club as well. Yeah, and Just putting in something, sorry. Just want to, on that case, like Mino Raiola acting on all three parties. Like, imagine you are an agent, right? You just started working as an agent and you started representing a player from Real Madrid, 19 or 20 years old player, right? And imagine you're in a situation that player is now wanted by Manchester United. Okay, consolation, you have a player, you're looking after the player. And uh, Manchester United tells you, if you bring us this player, we give you 20 million because we want, he's the best next star. It's like, we want to give you agency for 20 million. Real Madrid says, if you bring us 100 million as a uh, money f to the club, we give you 20 million commission. And the player, you represent the player, you get your normal 10%, whatever. And you have it on the table. Who would say no? Who of you would say, no, I'm not taking that money? It's not, it's not what I deserve. None of you. Why is everyone angry with Mino Raiola? He take 50 million. Manchester United was so happy for that deal. They would even pay more. They said we spent less than we should as a package. Juventus was happy. They got all the money they wanted to. And the player was happy. He made his deal of his life. And the agent made it happen. Yeah, the numbers are very high. But the regulations are allowing it to do it. You're not changing the regulations. You let it happen as FIFA or the uh, clubs are happy to pay it. Man United is happy, Juventus is happy, everyone is happy. And then, and then they blame uh, an agent for that. Why, why did you earn so much money? It's like say, blaming someone who is in the oil or finance industry and making a lot of money because he's smart and the system allows him to make the money. So then don't allow multiple representation, right? And a lot of other things. Don't allow that, that uh, one agent can represent three parties in one deal if you don't want to have that. But as you can see, all of you would have taken the money. But everyone blames that guy to say, yeah, you, you took so much money on that greedy guy. But yeah, I just was sorry that I have to break you there. But that was important. Well, I'll also play the devil's advocate on that as well, if that's all right. Um, which is, it, it brings an extra layer of conflict of interest. So, um, and the other element as well is that it's actually very difficult to act in the buying club's best interest and the selling club's best interest at the same time because I presume what had happened, I wasn't involved in the deal, I presume what had happened is Riola said to Juve, I think I can get, let's just say Juve wanted 50 million for Pogba. And then Riola probably went to Juve and said, actually, if I can get 85, let's split the difference. And Juve probably said, brilliant, if you can get 85, take half, that's fine. But his obligation, Riola's obligation to Manchester United would have been to try and reduce the transfer fee to get the best deal for Manchester United. So again, I always find that a really difficult one actually in practice to be able to, to work through. But again, if you want to analyze both scenarios mm. from what the people were discussing about the, the other agents mm. in Turkey and this, it's similar. It, no, it's exactly yeah, the same. It's Yeah, but I'm saying if I'm Manchester United yeah. and I've my agent, the agent that I've employed to negotiate that transfer agreement mm -hmm. is also trying to find, speak with Juventus to get a higher price, it doesn't work. It's, 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 a, I mean, it's a conflict of interest. Yes, yeah. and everybody is happy with that in the end. But what I'm trying to say also is that um, FIFA now are now outlawing that possibility. So it's not going to be possible. So, yep. You can look in a different way. Like there are some different uh, uh, national tax law entries inside. You know, like in Italy, there is a, the law is set in there for four or five years where if the player comes from outside, the, it's not anymore, the natural divorce is not at 50%. Mm. Mm. 
obviously put higher the wage the player with the tax help. Yep. And then, and then at the end, you can get money for that. Uh, yep. Correct. But what, uh, again, just I, I love your creativity. <laughs> But again, what you will have in, for example, the regulations that I see and the regulations for the contracts I will say is that there will be a specific obligation which will say that the player cannot, when they receive their remuneration, their money, cannot pass that back to their agent in any way. So the player then runs a risk from a regulatory perspective that they breach and then would be a problem. I'm not saying... It normal 10%. What's normal 10%? The, the, the commission we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree on that. Correct. Hold on one sec. Hold on one sec. Anyone else? Just before this turns into a nice debate. Yeah, exactly. Then. Yeah, potentially. Potentially. All right, let's keep going because um, everyone might be starting to get hungry as well at the same time, <laughs> even though I really like the conversation and we can keep going as well. Um, Actually, it's a good thing. Actually, if people are listening, then they're keeping on discussing. Um, a very important element that now I just wanted to focus on for two minutes is we've talked so far about the fact that uh, clubs pay their agent, clubs pay the agent. It looks like, based on my understanding of the rules now, the FIFA regulations that will come into play uh, whenever they do, is that that will be outlawed. So what will happen is players will have to start paying their agents directly or via the club, i.e. the club will deduct from their salary so they don't feel that they have it, the money that would then go to the agents. But the difficulty with that, just to let you know, is at the moment with the club paying it, it becomes more tax efficient for the player. I can give you an example in a few minutes afterwards, again from the tax perspective. But the important thing to note here is that the player will then be paying their agent from their net salary. From their net salary. That's very important. And I don't think anyone actually realizes the, significant, uh, the significance of that for players. Because in a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of jurisdictions, um, players cannot deduct, cannot deduct their commission that they would pay to their agent from their annual tax return. It has to be from their net salary. Well, no, I don't know. So what I'm, what I'm maybe suggesting is, so for example, in other sports, so for example, in golf and in tennis, those tennis players and those golfers pay their agent directly, whatever percentage, but then from their, um, from y well, yes, from their gross, because they can deduct it as a deductible taxable expense. Yes, but in football and in cricket, they cannot. In England, all in England, no, in across different countries. I don't know in all different okay. countries, but in England especially, it's a specific tax regulation, which is really silly. So this is why the problem of players paying their agents in certain jurisdictions causes a major problem. Peter, and then. I doubt it, but I don't know because there's all what's going to happen is there's going to be structures that are going to be put in place to try and deal with this issue. What will happen at the top level for the top clubs is what you've probably seen already, what Urquhart's seen, is what will, what's called a gross up clause. So, what will happen is the accountants and the tax guys are going to have to work out the net payment that the players would have to pay to their agent and then work out what the club will have to pay the player from a gross tax perspective so that the net amount works out as the right payment to the agent. Have I just confused everyone in the room? <laughs> Do you want me to say it one more time or are we okay? One more time? No, we're okay, we get it. One, yep. I'm 
going to go through that with you at the break just to show you why that might not quite be the case. Um, but we'll talk about that if that's all right. So Lucy asked a good question, which is just generally, does this change the dynamic of the club and the player depending on the negotiation position, which is right. Um, it's helped clubs considerably them being able to play, pay players directly, and it's also helped players from a tax perspective. This whole dance of clubs paying players, sorry, clubs paying agents is effectively to save players tax money. That's actually the truth of the reason why you split it then between player and agency side. And now that potentially not being the case because of the FIFA regulations, um, interestingly causes a few issues. But one, if I actually think that if, if the FIFA regulations just simply said uh, players have to pay their agents and we're not going to do any caps, I, th I think that's, that would be fine. Because as rightly as you said, if players understand what they have to actually pay their agent, they, what they actually have to pay rather than the club paying, they would quickly work out when that percentage would be necessary and how high or low that percentage would be. Answer the question, I'm going to make it slightly more complicated. Sorry. <laughs> so what's going to happen in practice, as you talked about, the player, uh, if you remember, the dual representation contract was player services, club services. For that 3%, let's just go the cap, the 3% club services, the club can pay the player's agent, that 3%. But for the other 3%, the player has to pay that directly to the agent and it will only be able to be a 50-50. So in practice, two things are happening. There's two different, there's going to be two different money flows. There's going to be one money flow, which is going to be a club to the player's agent for club services, and a player to the agent for player services. So what I mean is, to your example in the back, it, I don't think it will work that the, the the non-agent will just get paid whatever it is for consultancy services because they'll have to be in the deal to get paid from the club side in the first place. And that's what will make it difficult. So in the end, what we're hearing more and more of in the industry now is what's actually happening is the club will pay part to the agent for the club services, but for the player services, every a lot of new deals are happening now whereby the, the club will arrange for the money to be paid to the player's agent as a deduction from the player's wages directly, net. The room has gone so quiet because of this, I'm sorry. It's hurting my brain a bit as well. Just going to go there just for a second. So does, it, so does that second part then mean the accountant for the player paying the agent, even though the money is being transferred from the club? It's got, yeah, because it's coming from the, the player's salary basically. Just because in that case, can the two commissions be different? Say, for example, if it's three percent on the I love this creativity. <laughs> <laughs> He's Turkish. Yeah, exactly. Can, the can they just pay cash straight <laughs> in a, a in a in, in a briefcase? <laughs> Correct. So, no is the answer. So, the issue that's happened a lot of time that FIFA have said is it needs to be a maximum split of 50-50.
So it can't be, you can't pay 99% club services and 1% player services. Oh, no, what I mean is 3% the club pays as services, but then the player and the agent to save tax, they show it as 1% as the agent fee, the other 2% he charges as consultancy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I understand. Well, let's see, but I think that would be difficult. I think it's busy. Yeah, the, the the tax authorities in the UK would say that that's um, that's actually tax that they should have received and therefore would be a problem. But I like the idea of tax evasion. So what the, f the new FIFA regulations say is that if a transaction happens within a period of time where uh, a club also enters into any other type of financial deal with an agent, the presumption is that that was for a transfer unless the agent and the club can prove otherwise. Same. Yes, but they would have to disclose it and then FIFA would have. Just one at the back then, just one second. I'm sorry we're going on a little bit. Is that, everyone's okay. You could have different models. So if I give you an example, sometimes what you might actually do is keep adhere to the three, six, ten percent, but then you'd actually take a higher percentage of all commercial deals, for example, and then work through how that might work in practice. There was somebody else. Yeah. No, my question was um, is it based on the player's paying agent? So is it is that payment still going to pass through the clearing? Seeing the um, no, the no, it won't pass through the payment. Why? Because what they are talking about definitely is going to happen. Because there's no checks and balances. The clearinghouse is there for checks and balances. Yeah, but if I give you, if I play the other position, all that will happen is if it goes to the clearinghouse, it will go to the clearinghouse, it will then go to the player still, and the player will still be able to decide what they want to do. Yeah, but the clearinghouse does all the checks and balances to keep the integrity of that payment. Yeah, but, but they won't know. As soon as the as soon, it's like anything, as soon as the payment goes to the agent or as soon as the payment from the clearinghouse goes to the agent or the player, FIFA will have no visibility on what happens to any of that money next. Then the, pay, the players paying the agent, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, I'm one of them that will really, really be at hand of because if they want transparency, there wouldn't be transparency from that part. If the, if the top part is being covered, passing through the clearinghouse, and you go to the lower part, you go to the agent, they're really, really not going to be a kind of a clarity with that. Because obviously, the corruption area that was trying to hit against mm. is still going to be there. For example, we still go back to the scenario that I, I talked about earlier, transferring the money directly to an account. An agent can discuss with the player and and so they transfer this. Obviously, that's out of the top jurisdiction because it's come to the lower level. So if it's not passing through the clearing house, I think it's really, really going to be a confusion. You're going to see at, at, at the, at, as the year goes by that there's a lot of discrepancy in either the payment that agent received there's going to be a lot of court cases. Yeah, the, the issue generally was, is it was felt like it was more secure that if the, cl the player's club paid the agent, they were going to get the money. Whereas if the agent has to go through the player, it becomes a bit trickier to ask your client for money, even though that, I, I understand the point. Yep, one at the back. Yep. Non-compliance. 
it would generally be disqualification, so then you can't actually act, um, and then you won't be able to receive any transfer, uh, sorry, any commission or anything through the clearing house as a result, okay. is the general idea. I actually don't know is the truth. Um, I don't, you, you I might know more detail. The truth generally is they've been consulted on a lot more than the agents have in truth. Um, I actually think they would prefer that um, agents are paid by their, the, their clients rather than go through this dance to a degree. That could be wrong. Um, so maybe to add something there, there was a good question. Um, one of my uh, questions at FIFA was, why there's no limit on a club side of payments? Like a sporting director can earn five million, ten million, put in the game. Is there and why they don't get any education, right? To be sporting director is zero answer, right? I'm mean, this is uh, this is the this is the problem. On the one side, you want to educate us agents and tell us an exam in front of us, but on the other hand, the people we are dealing with in the clubs are rubbish. So how will I proceed? If the guy inside the club is not educated, is just known from someone who knows someone and put in a game as a sporting director, and I'm as an agent going there and want to negotiate a deal, and I know that is only a puppet there put into the game again for someone else. So why is there no barrier for them representing clubs, making the, the entire football economy more transparent, integrity and everything? They're talking about all these things, but when it comes to their side, nothing is changing, no exam, nothing, no limits of payments to sporting directors. Why not? A sporting director shouldn't earn more than 500,000 then, right? If you're in this kind of clubs. If you're in a Premier League clubs, then you should not earn more than 1 million, whatever. Why don't they have limits, right, in their earnings? Why they limit? Why do you cap only agents in the world of football? If you cap, then cap everyone, right, to be fair. You cap players then as well. Well, why don't you cap players then, right? Cap players, cap agents, cap sporting directors, cap uh, everyone in the business. You can't just cap only one side and say, we're creating a nice transparent area where's all the dodgy stuff happening in the club side. Why is no one going there and checking, hey, wait a minute, why you guys are doing these transactions and these payments and this and that? What kind of people are working here? Is there no any entry barrier for these people representing and working inside clubs? No, it isn't, you know, and that's one of the problems. It's not only we as agents. I agree we need an exam, we need education and everything, but as much as we need it, these guys need it as well. Right, but that's not uh, that's out of discussion because they're powerful. European club association, all of these people, they're a huge, powerful game player stakeholder. They will not start talking about for themselves these things, right? They rather talk about others. I just wanted to add that. I don't know if you have anything going on. Thanks, sir. No, it's really interesting. Um, five more minutes, I promise, and then everyone have lunch. Yeah, he had a question. What's happening with the, who, uh, how, who will then you pay as a result, yeah. So what tend, yeah, so what would tend to happen based on the current situation is let's just say uh, you're the player, you've done, Urquhart's done a great deal for you and based on the new regulations, you will then pay Urquhart 3%, let's say for example, or 6%, let's say, pay 6% to Urquhart. The two years runs out, Therefore, you can decide to sign with me. No, for example, I just saw an example. Uh, player just quit after one year. You yeah. Know? He, he, he yeah. Deal and then he just quit the agent. Yeah. So that would be a problem because then the agent would say, "Well, you're not allowed to quit my exclusive representation contract because it's for two years." For example, therefore, you need but to pay me. Yeah, but you still have to pay me for one more year, okay, so if you need to, and then you still have to pay. Mm. I've heard that too. Um, it would be very interesting. It might be on a country by country basis because some countries have specific terms for how actually how long um, a, a representation contract can last. So yeah. Hmm. I haven't heard that. It's interesting. Um, I don't know, but be, if you can send me anything that you've read on that, that would be quite cool. Yep. Does that mean that I have to start negotiating with my player in terms of how they pay me the money? 
you should already have that. So if you remember the first basis for the contract is you, if you're an agent, will have a representation contract with your player. It will say 5%, 10%, whatever it is. What we're saying is, is that if the FIFA regulations, our understanding is right, you will continue to have that underlying representation contract and you will uh, get the money directly from the player based on that relationship that you have. exploit the system? Yeah, great question again. I'm not giving you another book. Um, <laughs> but um, So the short answer is, on the minor side, uh, if um, uh, players' uh, parents are basically entering into the deals because the players are minor, will that lead to more exploitation if, pl uh, if players' parents don't understand exactly how things work? The short answer is absolutely. Uh, that's what FIFA are trying to do. And maybe I'm trying to work out. I think everyone's getting very hungry. Um, five more minutes, is that OK? Is that all right? You can't really say no, because you know, so <laughs> still keep going. Um, I'm going to just touch on the minor's point, if that's OK, actually on that point. Uh, then Jesse's going to talk on some brief minor points as well. Just at the back, yep. Uh, so the, the, qu uh, the question at the front. The question at the front was, um, if, if players are going to have to start paying their agents, uh, but then actually minors, um, uh, which are between 16 and 18 years old, are entering into deals, the, play, the player's parents are entering into those deals. Might there be more problems with exploiting the minor's position if the parents don't exactly know what's going on? I think the same is true for players as well, very young players who might not be guided by agents that know exactly what's happening too. Okay, uh, minors, if that's okay, Jamie. How's Instagram looking? <laughs> Thank you. Just briefly, um, okay, so there's going to be some changes coming also on the minor side of things I just wanted to touch on. The first thing is, we had a couple of questions already before, if uh, in, it's in lots of different jurisdictions in Denmark and in the UK especially that if you want if an agent wants to work with um, a minor which is generally classed as someone from the ages of 16 to 18 or that's slightly different in the UK um, then you have to do an enhanced um, effective police check to make sure that you're allowed to work with children that's the the, the, the general state of play and is very important and um, that's also going to be the case um, FIFA are going to put that stipulation in now, there's a few different issues um, if you're an English agent, because um, if you remember, in the, in the English rules, um, agents are allowed to approach um, a player in the year that the player turns 16. Just give me one sec, because my brain's going to hurt otherwise if I think you can. Um, now, what FIFA are effectively saying is approaches to minors won't be permitted until six months before the player can sign their first pro deal. Now in the UK, it's different in different jurisdictions, I'm going to base it on mine, is a player can sign their first pro deal when they are 17. So that actually means that in the UK it will be later than when they otherwise agents otherwise would have been able to do under the, the rules. Now, it's different in different jurisdictions, I completely get that, but it actually puts UK agents at a disadvantage of actually only six months before a pro deal is signed to actually uh, be able to liaise with players to try and find out that deal. Yep. No, I don't think they would be able to because the FIFA regulations will will be now the overarching regulations for every jurisdiction. Yeah. It's the DBS. It's basically yeah. It is yeah. It's DBS. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, and actually, the interesting the last thing on commission. Sorry, Jesse. I kept you waiting for ages. I'm sorry. Um, is uh, at the moment. 
So let's just say you're a UK agent, you've um, done the first deal for a minor, um, but it's a pro deal at 17. Under the quirk of the current FIFA, uh, FA regulations, um, an agent can only earn commission from a deal involving a minor, well, can't earn commission when they're involving a deal involving a minor. So you can only earn commission when the minor turns 18. So this is the quite quirk of it. So what actually happens as a result is, let's just say I've done a deal for a 17-year-old, I'm the agent, I can only receive my first tranche of commission as soon as the player turns 18. Now, what the FIFA regulations say, or is going to say, is that commission's actually payable to agents on a minor's first pro deal. So actually, this is of benefit to certain agents in certain jurisdictions, where you'll actually be able to commission off the first pro deal, even when the player is a minor. 